this. Sorry. The story of the Double Admiral presents so many startling and inexplicable features, and is altogether so peculiar, that were not its truth vouched for by a bishop, one might well hesitate to believe it. The bishop in question, one John Charles, received, in the October of last year, a letter from an old friend, who invited him to spend a quiet weekend at his seaside bungalow in Hampshire. This friend was a retired admiral, now in failing health, whom John Charles had not seen for several years. The bishop had, however, heard enough of his queer way of life to be curious to visit him, and put certain strange rumours to the test. And, moreover, in reading the admiral's letter, he fancied he could detect a peculiar urgency, hinting at something more than a mere desire for congenial company. John Charles at once decided to go, and so, wiring his acceptance and catching an afternoon train, after a somewhat hurried lunch, he found himself being greeted by his friend upon the little windswept station only some six hours after the receipt of the letter. Something was certainly wrong. The hand which shook his was cold and trembling, and the gaiety of the welcome was obviously forced. Reserving any comment upon his friend's appearance for a more convenient time, John Charles chatted the usual amicable nothings as they drove together to the bungalow. By the way, said the Admiral, as they drew up before the little white-painted building, I told you Beverly was here, didn't I? He'll be glad to meet you again. <laughs> there he is now. I can see him at the window. Descending from the trap, they stood for a moment in the salt sea breeze, as the driver helped the bishop to take out his luggage. Beverly came forward from the house and shook John Charles's hand. He was a tall, silent, and rather dreamy man, with dark eyes and a quantity of black, springy hair. The bishop, who had met him once or twice before, was privately inclined to despise him as an inefficient dabbler in psychology. He had a little secretive therapeutic establishment in town, where he called himself a psychist, and interviewed temperamental maidens at a kind of dusky shrine. When John Charles's luggage had been taken upstairs, and the bishop himself had followed it to remove the stains of his rather tiresome cross-country journey, the Admiral and Beverly went into the dining-room, where a cheerful fire spluttered and dinner lay temptingly upon the table. Beverly, said the Admiral, do you notice anything different in it tonight? The psychist turned away from a window to the fire, so that his face shone in a strange mixture of half-lights. No, Hood, he said. The Admiral walked over to the window, and the two looked out together over a patch of lawn, rather dreary in the failing light and swept now by a hurrying little breeze. "'You can't see it from this window,' resumed the Admiral. "'It's round the corner, just there.' He pointed to one of two other windows that gave on to the sea and the lawn in front. The blinds of both were drawn. "'Does he know?' asked Beverly, with a meaning lift of his eyebrows. No, not yet. I'll tell him after dinner. Here he comes. John Charles entered, and after him, the soup, sending up a most inviting steam. As they sat down came the sound of the rising wind, sighing round the cliffs, and panting about the windows like a curious person wanting to look in. During the meal, conversation languished, and it was not until the Admiral's man, Thomas, had disappeared, and the three were comfortably seated round the fire, that the host began to talk. He addressed himself particularly to John Charles, whilst Beverly stared into the flames, 
with the resigned, half-grudging air of one who listens to an oft-told tale. You're wondering, of course, why I sent for you, John, began the Admiral. You're wondering what's up, what's wrong. I'll tell you, I've told Beverly and got his opinion. Now I'm going to get yours. The shadow of Beverly's head, flying madly about the far corner of the ceiling, seemed to work in an ecstasy of approval. The Admiral glanced at it and at the real Beverly, and went on. When you came into this place, John, did you notice anything? I noticed at once how unwell you looked. Nothing more. I don't think so. Ah. The Admiral, sallow and pouchy-faced, bent his dark, restless eyes upon the fire. Outside, the wind still whispered curiously, and within, ever and anon would come the soft hish of falling ash, like a respectful commentary. This house, went on the old man, raising his left hand and talking hurriedly, is bad and... It's I that am the centre of its badness. You can see that I'm not well, no. But I'm not ill in the ordinary sense either. Listen, I've gone bad. Do you know what's wrong? I wonder if you looked at me very hard. Could you guess what's going wrong? Hood, said the bishop breathlessly. What do you mean? I'll tell you. I told one other man besides Beverly, and he laughed. My God, I'll kill the man that laughs again. Now look, look into my eyes, and tell me yourself what you'd say was wrong. It completed the strangeness of the situation that the bishop should be asked to answer his own question. Yet in the tense electrical moments that followed, he found his brain working to an inevitable conclusion. He was conscious of the old man's black eyes, glowing in the firelight like fervent beads, and conscious too of something weird and terrific in his whiskered face. But above all, he became subtly aware of what he was to say. The waiting pause grew, as it were, in meaning to the coming answer. I think I know what you mean, Hood. For a brief moment he paused again, looking at his friend's sallow face. Yes, there was the answer, evident, written terribly in every line of that wasted countenance. He went on. You look somehow as if something were preying on your mind, as if you were frightened of something. I should almost say, of course it's only a fancy, that you thought you were being tracked, followed. In fact, if you were what you looked, you would be... Yes, Hood. You would be a haunted man. Again, there was a silence of some seconds. Beverly knocked the ashes out of his pipe. And the bishop, who found that he had bent forward in the peculiar excitement of the moment, straightened himself up. The Admiral spoke. It's something we see, a long, long way out at sea, he said. It's not always there. Sometimes it goes altogether. What is it? asked John Charles, bluntly. We call it an island, said the Admiral. It's a kind of brown stain, just on the horizon that comes and goes. Beverly has seen it too. He stopped, and John Charles looked inquiringly at the psychist, who held his face averted. But other people, Hood, what do they say it is? Beverly answered. Other people, he said, do not see. Well, I do not always see it. I think... He broke off suddenly. The Admiral was speaking again. And now his words seemed to flow monotonously in a strange, unnatural smoothness. 
His eyes were fixed upon a point on the opposite wall. I can't escape from it. It follows me everywhere. Sometimes I come in here, where the blinds are drawn on that side, but it makes no difference. I can feel it there. It's there now. Just there. Without disturbing the rigid fixity of his head, he extended his left arm to the window, pointing. Oh, chap, said the bishop kindly. You must get away from here at once. Spend a week or two at the palace. Grace would love to have you. The admiral shook his head. It would be useless, he said. About a week ago, I took the train inland to Eastham. I thought I'd got away from it. I spent most of the day there without seeing it, and then, as I was having tea in a little restaurant, I looked up. Out of the window, there it was, far away, over the top of a hill, the same brown, evil shape. He paused, and into his eyes crept a look of terror. The woodwork around the windows ticked meditatively in the wind, and ash fell again from the fire, sympathetically. The important point to notice, remarked Beverly, is that the sight or even the thought of this thing is accompanied in Hood's case by a distinct waning or attenuation of personality, a continual tapping or sapping away of mind. How did you describe it, Hood? The Admiral answered his head thrust forward towards the wall over his long legs. When it comes, I seem to lose something. I can tell when it's coming. I have an awful headache first. Then something seems to be drawn out of me, sucked away. I can't explain it. Yes, he broke off, excited, seeking, as it seemed, for words. The firelight dancing on his face showed up long wrinkles playing over it as his mouth worked quickly. The two listeners were about to interrupt him, but swiftly he hushed them with his hand. Virtue. Something is gone, and I can feel it drawn away from me, over the sea. I felt like this before, as a child, as if... Something inside wanted to break away and fasten on to something else. That's it. Do you know, said John Charles, I was like that. Something, when I was a kid. Certain things had the most awful, indescribable horror about them. A yellow stain on the ceiling in my room. A particular picture in an old book. I used to know the number of the page and skip it so I wouldn't come upon it. An old, broken post along the railway line to school. It's funny. Old chaps like me, went on the Admiral, waving at them as the woodwork ticked feelingly about the window frames, and the psychist and the bishop, somehow saddened by the sound, looked regretfully about them. Old chaps like me set on in this way. Such poor old chaps... Listen, I shall go out one day and meet the thing. It's killing me. I, I, I am being undermined. The bishop takes up his story at the point where, on the following day, they set out in the Admiral's Cutter to visit the mysterious island. It is apparent that he joined in the amazing expedition with the prime object of humouring his old friend, particularly as he was quite unable to see anything more terrifying than a few trails of low-lying cloud hanging over that portion of the horizon to which the Admiral pointed. He had eaten a hearty breakfast and was impatient of the terrific moments of last night's talk. It was about ten when they started off, and John Charles, sausage-like in his white sweater, looked somewhat regretfully over the stern at the receding shore. A light, shimmering haze hung about, but the sun promised soon to dissipate it. 
For some time, the bishop, who was very content to leave the management of the boat in other hands, sat back, comfortably pulling at his pipe and thinking deeply. He was extremely sorry that his friend was suffering from such an unexampled attack of nerves, and renewed his resolution to get the admiral away to the palace. No other possibility than that of nerves ever presented itself to his mind. The conversation of last night seemed particularly silly in the sane morning light, and even the tragic and mysterious Beverly looked fairly normal in his boating flannels. Seated under the boom, the Admiral was gazing over the sea before him. He was crouching forward, with his head stuck out, so that his hands dangled between his knees. Some wisps of lightish hair, faded like his whole appearance, were caught and blown about his forehead by the wind. Sometimes they would get into his eyes, and then impatiently he would put up a hand, but apart from this, he was sitting in a strangely tense and rigid way. Idly, the bishop watched the trysail above him, so smoothly curving outwards in the breeze. Fixing his eyes on the truck of the mast, he followed it as it plunged in and out among the clouds, tracing shining lines and patterns with the motion of the ship. Gulls about the coast screamed, bickering, and ever and anon the pleasant break of dry and straining ropes came rhythmically. John Charles was very comfortable, and exceedingly disinclined to worry over anything. Happily, he dozed, cherubic. Presently, however, Beverly aroused him to take his place at the tiller. He did so, relighting his pipe, which had gone out. Half an hour must have passed since they set out, and they were making fair progress, though the wind was light and shifting. Up to this time, they had hardly exchanged a word. As they left the shore behind them and stole forwards, with some tacking, in the supposed direction of the island, a peculiar feeling began to settle over them. The strangeness of the expedition, which so far had, as it were, passed itself off as a holiday trip, again became apparent. And above all, the silent figure of Hood, sitting unnaturally still, filled them with vague misgiving. About this time, too, the rather sinister visage of the psychist, suddenly swinging round and snapping its eyes at John Charles, reminded that dismayed prelate of the very picture that had so terrified him as a child. How far are we from the shore now? asked John Charles less from interest in their position than from a keen desire to break the silence. About three miles, answered Beverly. You can't get much out of her in a wind like this. Is the course right, Hood? Keep straight on for a bit, said the Admiral. Straight on. We're getting near. Again there was a long break in the conversation and again an indescribable feeling of misgiving settled over John Giles. Something in the dreamy sunlit day, something in the light wandering winds, seemed growing tense and strained to breaking point. As the water lap-lapped against the sides of the cutter, and the tiller creaked in his hands, an almost uncontrollable desire to cry out came over him. This, however, he resisted, and they proceeded in silence as before. It was now, when the bishop was in the grip of these strange forebodings, that he saw the island for the first time. For some little while he seemed to have been half-conscious of a darkish shape. It dodged behind the mast with the movement of the boat, but it was not until this moment, as the cutter tacked suddenly to port, that the sombre smudge upon the sea rushed, as it were, to the opposite side, and hung over the starboard bow. Look, whispered John Charles to Beverly, pointing at the shape. Beverly nodded, but made no reply. He was looking intently at the Admiral, who still sat motionless, staring straight before him. The dark mass that they were approaching was curiously vague in outline. Straining his eyes at it, the bishop thought he could make out the appearance of cliffs, 
but owing to its distance and the peculiar haze that hung about it, it was impossible to determine anything with clearness. They held on their course for about another five minutes, and then tacked again so that the island was brought on to the port side. Beverly was looking at it through a telescope, which he presently handed to the bishop. Nothing more was to be made out through the telescope than was visible to the naked eye. A brown shade seemed brooding over all that portion of the sea, contrasting strangely with the sunlight that shifted on the water lying wide around. John Charles turned the telescope to the shore they had left, and then swept the horizon. Far away, a large, three-masted bark was making up channel, and to the west a dark speck upon the sea that might be a sloop beating to windward was slowly creeping in their direction. Than this, not a sign of life was to be seen. John Charles offered the telescope to the Admiral, but the rigid figure made no motion, so he returned the instrument to Beverley. The wind, which at the best had been but light, now almost quite forsook them, and they crept with irritating slowness through the water. Strangely enough, however, the boat which John Charles had noticed a minute or two before had now approached to within about three-quarters of a mile, and seemed to travel in the tail of the departing breeze. Beverly was looking at it curiously. Presently he put up the telescope and gazed long and fixedly. With his naked eye, John Charles could see easily that the boat was cutter-rigged, and might indeed be an exact replica of their own. Further, three dark figures were seated on the deck, one at the tiller, one beneath the boom, and one darker and plainer than the other two, craning forward under the mast. In the warm, creeping sunlight, the bishop felt himself shivering. His head was aching violently, and he had for a moment that strong sensation of contradictory motion that sometimes comes upon one in a train. He could have sworn that somehow the direction in which they were travelling was not that of a minute ago. Hood, whispered Beverly to the Admiral, look at that boat, Hood. There was no reply. The psychist strode over to the mast where the Admiral was sitting. And John Charles, from his station by the tiller, saw that his face went suddenly drawn and ashy. God, he cried out to the bishop, come here. He's gone. Poor old chap. John Charles leapt to his feet and joined Beverly. Together they looked down at the thing below them. Still rigid, as if carved in wood, the figure of the Admiral sat staring out to sea. In this rigidity even the chin was thrust forward with a horrible appearance of jocose truculence, and only the long arms still dangled slackly between the knees with the motion of the vessel. In the big blue eyes, wisps of pale hair, blowing in the wind. With a cry of dismay, the bishop went up to the corpse and shook it gently. It heeled over and fell, half prostrate against the mast. But the pale eyes remained fixed, staring ever forwards. Beverly bent down and put a hand against the figure's heart. Dead, he said. It's no go, Charles. Beverly, asked the bishop. Beverly, how did he die? The psychist made no reply. Instead, he took up the telescope again, pointing it at the boat that had passed them a few minutes back. It must have been moving very rapidly, for its three queer figures were no longer discernible, and it was fast fading from sight, pitching and tossing as it seemed, into the gathering mist ahead. Suddenly, Beverly spoke. Do you know where Hood is? He said. Bishop looked at him in amazement and made no reply. I'll tell you where he is, went on Beverly. And of all the words John Charles had ever heard, those that now followed seemed most fraught with sinister suggestion. I'll tell you where Hood is. He's in that boat that passed us, along with you and me. I saw him through the telescope. 
As he let the import of these words sink into his mind, the bishop stood gazing, now at Beverly, now at the body of the dead that, like some frightful doll, sat staring past him into vacancy. Then he looked at the sea round them, and a fresh confusion mingled with his fear. He was facing the stern, and far away he saw the uncanny boat, now but a dark speck in the distance, and to its left, where the shore should have appeared, was visible instead a vaguer mass that lay upon the water, like a huge, dun cloud. Hastily the bishop turned and looked for what had been the island. As he half expected, it was gone, and in its place stretched out the shore that they had left. There is a peculiar momentary condition of mind which psychologists have styled vertigo of direction. It may be brought about by coming out suddenly on a familiar place by an unaccustomed way, so that ideas of relative positions receive a violent and bewildering contradiction. In some persons the shock may even be so great as to cause temporary mental incapacity, and John Charles for some seconds remained half stunned whilst his mental compass achieved reluctant readjustment. It was true enough. The bishop's uneasy sense of contrary motion had received a sudden confirmation, and in the peculiar bewilderment of the reversal, he even forgot for a moment the existence of Beverly, and the horror of the admiral's death. Before them lay the shore as they had left it an hour or more ago. There was the tall cliff that rose to the east of the slip, and there in the background the billowy stretches of the downs lit up queerly by moving points and splashes and slowly creeping bands of yellow light. For some time, unable to shake off the persistent notion of the original seaboard at his back, the bishop felt as though something, playing frightful pranks with nature, had set up against the familiar Hampshire coast, another shore, that answered to it, hill for hill, and cliff for cliff. A queer, exotic quality seemed loose upon the air. Soft winds were blowing, and within John Charles's head, the violent aching passed away, and a host of yearning little tunes arose. Something unreal, something of the dreamy shimmer of the mirage, seemed to hang about the sunlit coast before him. Out of the golden haze, strange shapes seemed to tower and beckon to the bishop. He stood looking at them, oblivious to all else, his features drawn with pain. The prospect seemed beset by a haunting beauty, a sweet, fantastic madness. Those cliffs that hung above the gentle sea, the bishop prayed to them in a fierce agony of desire as to a face half mocking and torturingly dear. Now he reeled. He was gone haggard with this beauty. Gusts out of the ineffable breathed upon him. He clutched at the collar of his sweater and prayed again. Our father, he said. Dimly, as he was falling, he glimpsed Beverly out of the corner of his eye. He was conscious of a dislike of Beverly. He wore dirty flannels, which psychists should never do. No. A shower of strange inconsequences. A last mad scamper of flying thoughts. A last vain effort to size up the tremendous and perplexing things that had assailed his mind. And then, oblivion, purple-tinted and delicious. A lordly thing. One of the most human and pathetic points in John Charles's remarkable but evidently sincere narrative is the way in which he describes his attitude to the second admiral that he discovered upon awaking. Everything, said Beverly, depends upon the completeness of the reversal. This man is, to all intents and purposes, your old friend. Think of an hourglass. 
when the sand begins to fall from the upper into the lower bowl, we have what can be called a leaking or sapping away of the higher mass. But as the process nears completion, it is better to speak of the construction of the lower than the destruction of the higher. Beverly asked the bishop, has the sand nearly all trickled through? I think so, answered the psychist. The second hood appeared as you were unconscious, and that was seven hours ago. The last scene that it is needful to record took place the same evening. Disaster, says the bishop, overtook the kindly efforts of Beverly and himself to hide from their friend the real nature of the case. John Charles was describing his sensations to the psychist, when suddenly the Admiral, whom they had believed to be upstairs, came in upon them. It presently appeared that he had overheard their conversation, and was curious to learn its import. The bishop forced a laugh. I've just had a nap, he said. What I was telling Beverly was a dream. Something you gave me for supper last night has evidently played the very dickens with my constitution. Beverly grinned. Very realistic, he said. Particularly the last bit about the beloved cliffs. Most oriental. Like Omar Khayyam gone little mad. That, of course, was the cucumber. The Admiral poked the fire. No, he said, slowly. No, Beverly, old chap. I'm afraid that won't hold water. Why not? They chorused, hoarsely. Because, said the Admiral, and a world of terror was throbbing in his voice. Because, unfortunately, I've had a nap as well, and I've had the same dream, too. Today's story was The Double Admiral by John Metcalfe. It was read by Jasper Lestrade. If you enjoy the show, why not become a patron on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content? It's the surest way to help me keep creating. You can also buy me a coffee, like, subscribe, comment, share, follow on social media, and read the description for more information about the show and how you can engage with it. Until next time, sweet dreams.